Hey there, thank you so much for tuning in here at Mission Church. We hope that today's experience helps you in your journey in finding and following Christ. As always, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you here at 82 Stratford Drive any Sunday morning. And be sure to keep up with our latest messages by subscribing to our YouTube channel or to our podcast. But for right now, let's dive into today's teaching. How we doing? It's great to be with you guys. If you are here today, that means that you are just like me and you choose not to travel when everyone else is traveling. We're smart. We're the smart ones. Or um, if you're here, maybe you're a guest and you chose for some reason to travel here for spring break. Welcome to Illinois. It's amazing. <laughs> the, uh, the weather's going to be awesome this week, so wear sunscreen. Um, but welcome, seriously, packed house, uh, this is cool. We are on uh, week four, stop four, of Journey to the Cross. Quick review, um, we started on a crowded street, John taught us that week. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on a colt, and crowds are lining the street, and they're actually shouting. And they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Except that, like, just a few days later, many of those same people were shouting again, except they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. At the next stop, we end up at a sinner's table where Mary, and and Dan taught that week, Mary does this beautiful thing for Jesus. And as she's doing this beautiful thing for Jesus, his best friends, his disciples, are scolding her for doing it. And it's as if Jesus, who spent the best part of his life with these guys, it's as if they never heard a single thing that he said. And then last week, we're at a table again, and we're in a borrowed room. And Jesus and his disciples, they are uh, sharing uh, the Passover meal. They're having communion together. And for the first time, Jesus takes the bread, and he takes the cup, and he says, this is my body, and this is my blood. They never heard that before. And in saying that, he was saying, this is your rescue, This is your freedom. And all the while he's doing this, Judas, one of his best friends, is sitting across the table scheming and making plans to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. This journey to the cross would have been plenty difficult with people actually in Jesus' corner. But what has stood out to me over the last three stops, and, and again today with this one, is that Jesus was obedient to the will of God while those closest to him were failing him. In fact, in next week's stop, Jesus' best friend does something to Jesus that he swore to Jesus he would never do. And from the borrowed room, they make their way here to a lonely garden, about a mile to a mile and a quarter from the room where they were at. And they made this trek. The stop is 10 verses in Matthew chapter 26. And in these 10 verses, there are three things going on with Jesus that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at these three things because it is in these three things that you and I can find the key to everything. And when I say everything, I literally mean everything. It's within these three things that we find the key to the Christian life and how to experience the kingdom of God. And so just to see if you are with me, right? if you would like to know the key to the Christian life, And if you would like to know the key to experiencing the kingdom of God, go ahead and just maybe throw up your hand if you're into that, if you're interested. All right, so most of us, not all of us, which is great, you're in the right spot. So let's look at these three things. I appreciate your honesty. First thing we're going to learn from this stop in this lonely garden is this. What did Jesus feel? All right, what did Jesus feel? We will have the scripture on the screen. That baby is excited about what we're teaching. Welcome. Um, All right, let's read. Uh, The words in bold, just go ahead and read them with me. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the, read it with me, the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, farther actually. He fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, read this, may this cup be taken from me. First thing we're looking at is what did Jesus feel? These are the last moments of Jesus' freedom. 
and he longs to be with, he longs to commune with his heavenly father. And he says to his friends, his disciples, his followers, he says, hey, you stay here. I'm gonna go over there and pray. He says, keep watch. Now in saying keep watch, he wasn't saying uh, watch me. And he wasn't saying watch out. He was saying keep watch, be alert, be ready, specifically be spiritually ready. Be spiritually ready for what is to come in my suffering. This is what Jesus is saying, keep watch. If you've been watching March Madness, you would know a couple things. One, somehow St. Peter's is still dancing. <laughs> yeah, if John were here, because they're the Peacocks, he, I think he made that clear last week. If he were here, he would definitely have a St. Peter's jersey on. He's their number one fan right now, and I, and I am too, by the way. So you'd know that they're, they're still dancing, trying to play to get into the final four, I think at four o'clock today. A little PSA for you guys, in case you're wondering. The other thing that you would know is like almost every game is really, really close and comes down to the final seconds, almost every one. And there's this tremendous buildup that happens and you notice yourself like leaning into the TV. Maybe you're like standing and cheering. You're like, I didn't even go to this school, but I really want them to win. There's this buildup. Guys are sweating. They're tired. Some are actually in agony as the clock comes to a close. This is what Jesus is saying. Okay, they weren't playing basketball, but you can track with me. He's saying it's the fourth quarter. There's only a few seconds left. I know you're tired. I'm dying here. Will you stay with me? Will you be with me in this suffering? This is what Jesus is saying. In verse 38, we read, it said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus, who was not prone to hyperbole, like he didn't exaggerate. That wasn't his thing. He said that he was sorrowful to the point of death. What Jesus was saying is, I am dying here, except he actually meant it. Jesus was saying to his friends, I am sorrowful to the point of death. I am, I am in agony. I am experiencing this crushing that should this crushing and agony and sorrow continue, it will eventually kill me. And it did. Jesus began to, to feel this agony and this sorrow and this crushing in the garden and he felt it all the way up to his final breath and his final words where he cried out, it is finished. This is what Jesus felt. What caused this sorrow? Well, Jesus is both fully God and fully man. And if you were to think about what Jesus was facing just from a human perspective, you could understand his sorrow and his pain. If I were to tell you that tomorrow evening you were going to die of crucifixion on a Roman cross, that would put you to a point of sorrow and agony. You probably wouldn't have words for it, but if you tried, you'd probably say, this is killing me. This is what's going on with Jesus. But this isn't actually the source of his sorrow, believe it or not. It would be mine, but it wasn't the source of his sorrow. What Jesus is experiencing in this garden is a foretaste of what in a matter of hours he's going to feel the full weight of. Jesus who marched into Jerusalem to move towards his physical death. He knew what was coming. He's now getting just a taste of the spiritual magnitude of his death in the garden. In verse 39, he cries out, my father, if it's possible, that's what I would do too. If it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. This cup is the suffering that he will face. This is what the cup represents. It's the forsakenness of God. It's the, it's the turning away of God away from him. It is the wrath of God that he will bear. What is the wrath of God? It is the holy and righteous anger and fury directed at sin, all right? What he was about to face, he's getting a foretaste of what he's about to feel the full weight of, the holy and righteous anger and fury of God directed at your sin and directed at my sin. This is what Jesus felt. And it's what all of us would be feeling right now if not for him and what he went through. The weight of sin, your sin, my sin. Therefore, the full wrath of God. And therefore, the forsakenness of his father, the turning away. And now this breaking of communion between him and his heavenly father. In a word, hell. This is what Jesus felt. So if this is what Jesus felt, what did Jesus follow? Let's look at that. Let's go back to verse 39. My father, it says, if it possible, 
may this cup be taken from me. Yet, say this with me, not as I will, but as you will. In fact, he prays this three times in the garden. Verse 44 said, he returned a third time praying the same thing. Not as I will, but as you will. Eight words, I'm still waiting for my kids to say back to me when I ask them to do something. (laughs) Maybe with like a British accent, not as I will, but as you will. (laughs) That'd be cute. They don't do that. It's funny. For me, seriously though, for me as someone who has put my faith in the truth that Jesus bore and took on the weight of my sin, it has become even more meaningful the chasm between what he felt, the sorrow and agony, but yet what he still chose to do, what he followed, the will of God, has made what he did and makes what he did even more meaningful. Literally nothing compares to the heroic decision that Jesus made, but I'm gonna try. And I'm gonna try to help you understand by using what I always use, examples from sports. So if you go to this church or if you're new and you're not into sports, I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. Um, We love sports. We do love Jesus way more, but we do love sports. So I got some sports examples just to help you understand. They don't compare, but let's try. 1996 Olympics, remember this? Carrie Strug, remember this moment? This was down in Atlanta, I believe. She, uh, She has an opportunity to follow through with something to win the gold medal for her team. Not herself, but for her team. And she has in front of her two attempts at a vault. Not the kind you break into, the kind you run full speed at, jump off a little spring, use your hands to do like eight flips and eight twists, and they expect you to land it perfectly. But she has two tries, so that's good. So she tries, and she nearly does it the first time, but she doesn't quite. And she severely hurts her ankle, and you could see how she's feeling. Does it look like she wants to do that again? Yeah, no. But she did it anyways. She actually landed it. Her team wins the gold medal. 2004 American League Championship Series, amazing series. Kurt Schilling. Do you remember this, the bloody sock? Was it ketchup? I like a good conspiracy, if you know me. Um, he, uh, he had surgery just a few days prior. He was obviously in pain. He's bleeding. But he goes out to pitch in game six. They're down 3-1. The, the series was down 3-1 to the Yankees. He, he goes seven innings, one hit. They win the game. They win game seven. They go on to win their first World Series in like 80-some years. Kurt Schilling. And then, of course, I have to, Michael Jordan in 1997. The flu, sorry, flu game that we now know is the food poisoning game. Maybe, who knows? We'll never know. It doesn't matter. But they're down the whole game. He has flu-like symptoms. He's feeling like if you felt what he felt today, you'd have to quarantine for 14 days. (laughs) I had to. I had to. Luckily for us, he didn't do that. But they were down the whole game, and he willed his team to victory. He scored 38 points, and his teammate, Scottie Pippen, famously helped him off the court. Now, I said it, but I'll say it again. These moments and others are meaningful because of what they felt, but yet the follow-through that they did anyways, not even for the sake of them, but for the sake of everybody else. And this is not for comparison. It doesn't compare, but it is for comprehension. It's to help you understand just a little bit, maybe like 1% glimpse into the magnitude of what Jesus felt, and yet still he decided to follow the will of God. See, before Jesus surrendered his hands and his feet to the cross on a hill, he first surrendered his heart to the cross in the garden. The reason Jesus suffered so deeply in the garden is because it is there where he chose where he decided to be your ransom and my ransom. And in doing so, yes, Jesus became our substitute, but he also became our standard. He actually set the standard in doing this. In eight words, he exemplified the Christian life, not as I will, but as you will. What Jesus felt, the wrath of God. What Jesus followed, anyway, the will of God. So what did Jesus find? Let's look at that. He said to his best friends, right? Three years, they'd just been hanging out nonstop, besties. He invested the best part of his life into them. He said, hey, keep watch, pray, be alert. What did Jesus find? Not once, not twice, 
Not three times. What do you find him doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. That's nice. Keep in mind, Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm going to go over there and pray. If you guys want to join me like that, that'd be, that'd be helpful. He said, I am experiencing sorrow and anguish to the point of death. Keep watch. Now, I know what they felt. They were tired. Their bellies were full. They just ate and drank for probably a few hours. They were tired. He says, keep watch. Now, to be fair, they weren't selling him out for 30 pieces of silver like Judas was, to be fair. But at least Jesus knew where Judas stood. Upon returning the second time, Jesus reminded them, hey, guys, not upset. Here's why this is happening. The spirit is willing. Like, I know you want to pray deep down, but the flesh is weak. And every time he returned, he was seeing what was winning. And it was not spirit. It was flesh. See, spirit is what responds to God's will. And flesh is what responds to our will weakness. I'm very familiar with this, and you probably are too. Spirit is what responds to God's will. Flesh is what responds to our weakness. And Jesus set the standard in the garden for how to experience the kingdom of God. Eight words, not as I will, but as you will. Now, knowing this, what I just said, it's not enough. And I actually don't think it's where we as Christians get stuck. I believe most of us desire to want to do the will of God. I think most of us want to desire to experience the will of God, or at least we're open to it. This isn't where we get stuck. Where we get stuck is we have severely overcomplicated the doing of the will of God. What we as Christians tend to ask is this. What is God's will for my life? Okay? We tend to ask, what is God's will for my life? Sounds like a really good question, and I actually can understand how you would get to this question. I'm wrapping up a very powerful book that I'm reading for the second time. I read it when I was 19, actually. It didn't stick, so I'm rereading it again because my 20s weren't good, which I've gone through my 30s too, by the way. But I'm reading this book (laughs) for the second time, Experiencing God by Henry Blackaby. Highly recommend it. And he actually says in the book, he said, "Uh, the wrong question to ask is, What is the will of God for my life? The right question to ask is simply, what is God's will? That's it. What is God's will? And I don't know when this happened to us as Christians, but I know why it happened, and I hate to break it to you. It's because we're selfish. No offense, you're selfish. I know I'm selfish. We're selfish. And a long time ago, sin entered into the story of humanity, actually in another garden. And when sin entered into our story, uh, it deceived and it twisted and it distorted us in, in our minds and in our hearts to thinking that even good things are in a certain direction. But that is not how the kingdom of God works. The kingdom of God actually has a specific direction. God's will has a direction. Maybe this will help. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a palindrome. Have you heard of a palindrome? Okay. Wow, a lot of you. I feel dumb. I didn't know what this was. I know of them, but I didn't know it was a thing. So if you don't know, if you're like, yeah, like me, let me help. So this is what I've been learning. Actually, Dan schooled me in this this week. This is a picture into how Dan's brain works and what he knows. So uh, an easy one, dad or mom, okay? Say say it. Either way, it sounds the same thing, okay? Let's go a little next level, right? Uh, anyone named Hannah in here, right? So that would be one. Are you a Hannah? Oh, okay. You just thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, Hannah, here's another one. Race car. Say race car. Yeah, race car. Okay, here's one that's not a word. It's a phrase. And I didn't have to Google this. Dan actually knew this. Here it is. A man, a plan, a canal, <laughs> Panama. <laughs> Did you guys know that one? Some of you knew it because you finished it. A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Say it one way. Sounds the same as if you say it the other way. However, the Christian life does not work this way, okay? Let me show you what we actually do and how we actually get it wrong, if I may, for the next few moments. Here's where we start. We start over here. And where here is, is what I will call my feelings. This is where we start with my feelings. So now my feelings, I'm a feeler too, by the way. Could be good feelings, could be bad feelings, could be painful feelings, could be sorrowful feelings. 
Could be feelings that align with the word of God. Could be feelings that don't align with the word of God. Doesn't actually matter. What matters is that we're starting here with my feelings, okay? So then what happens is we move over here. My decisions. Because I feel certain things, I'm gonna decide to do certain things, okay? Tracking, just two steps, all right. Now I make these decisions, right? Excuse me. So now, these are my circumstances. I have life circumstances that flow from my decisions that flow out of my feelings. And you get to these circumstances, and they might be good. You might even say they're great. But what I hear a lot from y'all and what I experience a lot in my own life is this feeling like my circumstances are a little unfulfilled. Like, you ever thought, there must be more to what I'm going through? You ever felt that? Just me? No, you felt it. So these are your circumstances. And because this isn't quite sufficient, well, now now my desires change, right? Like, I I can't stay there. I, I must have something more, something else. And so now my desires change, my longings change. Um, I need or desire or want uh, something, somewhere, or maybe even someone new. So because I felt a certain way and I decided to do a certain thing and I landed in a certain place, now I must desire something else. It's actually quite natural. Let me say this before I keep moving. Sadly, this is where most of us stop and then return and just do this cycle for our Christian life until we no longer are living, sadly. We feel something, we decide something, we have circumstances, we desire something else, and instead of pushing through, even in the wrong direction, we just go back to how we feel. We start the whole process all over again. By the way, with the best of intentions. So desires, so because I desire to no longer be there somewhere else, well, now my plans change, right? Right? Now my plans change. If you're over here and you're strategic enough to take your desires or you can hire someone who's gifted to help you, now you can get here, okay? Break out of that cycle. Now you can get here. And now I can make plans for my life, right? They're probably good because why would you make a bad plan, right? So now you have my plans, Now, because you have my plan or I have my plan, well, now my prayers change. Because if I have a plan, now I need God to do what? Bless it. And if I pray long enough for God to bless my plans for my life, well, now I've just deceived myself into now I'm doing God's will. Of course I'm doing God's will. Except you really have no idea if you are or aren't. I hope you are and you hope you are, but are you? Maybe, I don't know. My point is that's not the actual point. The point of my life is not for Tommy to get the will of God for Tommy's life. That's not the point. So like, I'm very confident in my wife and that God had her for me. I'm very confident of that. I'm confident in the community we live in. I'm very confident in the work that I get to do in service to this church. I have no idea if it is the will of God for my life or not. I don't. And a couple months ago, that really bugged me, and I'm actually all good with it now. But I don't actually know if this is the will of God for my life, because it's not the point of the Christian life. You tracking? All right. This is not new, but it feels new, because we don't talk about it like this. Let me show it to you in the other direction. Can I do that? Here's what it could look like. So we start, while I'm here, I might as well start here. We start with God's will, and we ask, what is God's will? Will. It's a great question. Not a trick question here. Where do we find God's will? Where do we find it? Louder. Where do we find God's will? The Bible. It's in the Word of God. The will of God is in the Word of God. Now, to be clear, the Word of God has so much of the will of God in it that you could never accomplish it in your lifetime. I totally get that. That doesn't mean we don't try. So we go to the Word of God, but it has so much in there. Where do I start? This is just a suggestion. There's no right place to start. Um, In the New Testament, we see something called the greatest thing, the great thing, and the only thing. For me, I'm like, maybe I'll start there. Greatest thing. Jesus said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, no, by the way, love your neighbor as yourself. Start there. You now know that. The great thing is the great commission. Go and make disciples. Help other people do the greatest thing. 
Paul said to a church, he said, the only thing that matters is faith expressed through love. Take a risk. Put yourself on the line for the sake of the love of other people. Just start with those three things. Greatest thing, great thing, only thing. Now, just gave you an example of three things. What if you're like, yeah, but I still don't want to do it? Guess what? I've actually been there before. I get there a lot. I don't want to actually do it. What if the pain in your life is paralyzing that you can't do the will of God? I've actually been there too. What if the sin in your life is keeping you from doing the will of God? I've actually been there too. But now my prayers change. So now I'm praying like Jesus prayed. And I'm praying those eight words, not as I will, but as you will. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And I pray prayers out of a place of sin, confession, as Jesus taught us, forgive me of my debts. And I thank him for taking them away. And then I say, would you give me your heart? Give me what you desire. Would you give me that? Jesus says in John 14, he says something that we twist and get wrong. But what it says is that he says to his disciples, he says, I will do, not you will do. He says, I will do anything that you ask in my name, Jesus' name, that glorifies God. We think that means he's gonna give you whatever you want. That's not what he said. He said, I, Jesus, I will do the work if you ask in my name and it glorifies God in heaven. Do you think if you asked for his heart to do the will of God, he would give it to you? Do you think that? I think he would. I think he would. So now my prayers change, and then all of a sudden, would you look at that? My plans change. Here's how they change. And this is gonna sting, because it stung me, because I'm a planner. What you will learn is you don't actually need a plan. You don't. You don't actually need a plan. Can they be helpful? Yes. Can they be harmful? Yes. But you don't need a plan. My plan now, I just do the will of God. That's my plan, okay? So now that I've got this actually quite simple plan, now my desires change. What I didn't want to do just back there, God has shaped my heart into I actually want to do it. Why do I want to do it now? Because I was created to do it. You and I were created to do the will of God. Why wouldn't it be the most fulfilling and desirous thing ever? It's still obedience. It's still difficult at times. It always will be. But now all of a sudden, like, I want different things. The sin I used to desire, like, I actually don't desire anymore. Nothing I did, but the sanctifying power of Jesus in me. So now my desires change. Well, if I want to do the will of God and my desires change, well, now all of a sudden, my circumstances, they change. And everything around me might actually look the same. But Henry Blackaby says this in his book. He says, Obedience is spelled A-D-J-U-S-T, adjust. If you want to know and do the will of God and obey his will, it will require constant adjustment to your life. This is how my circumstances change. If I want to see where God is working, then I got to go to where God is working to experience his will. So now my circumstances are different. I don't quit my job, although I might. I don't move away, although I might. But I might actually look at my current circumstances and bring all this stuff, God's will and my desires, to those people at my job and to the place where God has me. Instead of escaping, I might just stay and bring everything that he is doing in my life to the people in my life. So now my decisions change. And here's how they change. They get smaller. Not less significant, but they get smaller because he knows Step four, five, six, seven, eight, and beyond. He already knows that. In his ways, they're higher, they're wiser, they're greater, they're smarter than better than anything else that I can come up with. His plan for my life back there is better than anything else I can dream up. I don't gotta worry about it. I just have to do the next obedient thing. That's my daily decision, hourly decision, minute by minute decision. Just do the next obedient thing. Which then leaves us with these <laughs> Our feelings, they didn't go away. See, I didn't do this robotically. 
The way that God loves us is he gives us free will. I got to choose to do this. And so along the way, I felt certain things. And oh, by the way, it's not always great. I feel good things. I feel bad things. I feel hard things, sorrowful things. And you will too. And you do. The difference here, though, when you end up here instead of starting here, this is important, and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings while I'm talking about feelings. When you know and do the will of God, your feelings are no longer an idol, and now they're an offering. So they're not the thing that you serve. They're the thing that you submit. Why? Because he has clearly proven that he knows and understands what you're feeling, and by the way, the root of what you're feeling. He gets all that. And I'm not saying you take feelings and shove them under the rug. That is not what I'm saying. We've never said that around here. I'm just saying feelings are no longer an idol. This thing that I serve, the most important thing is how I feel. They're now something that I submit. I give this to him because he knows about them already. So what I just walked through, like I said, it is not new. Like, it's not new. It feels new, probably. That's why some of you are giving me deer in headlights right now. And that's good. That's where I've been the last couple weeks. Been like, oh, wow. Mm. It's okay. To so those of you who know and follow Jesus and you would say that he is Lord, what I have been hoping and praying, it's nothing I can do, what I've been hoping this, the work of the Spirit would do is to help you really see the chasm between what Jesus felt and what Jesus followed. Like sorrow to the point of death. That's what he felt. But what he followed through with was the will of God. I've been hoping that that would actually mess with you a little bit because it's been messing with me. Uh, I was hoping and am hoping, I'm still hoping, that seeing that you actually have an option. You can actually start with your feelings or you can actually start with the will of God. I've actually been hoping that that would move you to get out of this cycle where you keep getting stuck and feeling unfulfilled and just go there, start there. How do I do that? Well, Easter's three weeks away. John's been doing these great short devotionals where there's usually like one thing that he pulls out just take that one thing for the next three weeks and just say, this is going to be my priority. I'm going to do this part of the will of God. And then just see like how your prayers and plans and desire, just see how they change. And yeah, like it's hard. I, I haven't figured this out. Like I want to go back to here all the time. To, I'll, I'll feel it today. I'm going to feel something. If St. Peter's loses, I'm going to be really mad. <laughs> I'm going to feel a lot of pain. We want to say a lot of things, not really. But like, I'm going to feel things, and that's okay. It doesn't make me a bad person, it doesn't make you a bad person. But I got to keep coming back to God's will and trust that he'll take care of everything else, right? Jesus said in John 6, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. If the Son of God was able to say, yeah, I want to do the will of God, not mine, how much more should we be willing to? Jesus is saying, keep watch, stay with me, be alert. If you were to enter into your life right now, what would he find? Sleeping or spiritual alertness and readiness to join in his suffering, to do the will of God. Not for your life, sorry, just to do the will of God. If you're not Someone who knows and follows Jesus yet, we are glad that you are here. Jesus also prayed this a couple verses later in John 6. He said this, For my Father, that's God, for my Father's will is that everyone, not some, that everyone who looks to the Son, that is Jesus, and believes in him shall have eternal life. If you want to experience the will of God and the kingdom of God, then just pray to enter into it. He has already done his part through the person of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, come, I stand at the door, just knock. We have a vision of a movement of Jesus. We talk about it, it's on the wall. If you take a tour, you'll hear about it. A movement of Jesus, in other words, is basically the kingdom of God breaking out. If a local body of believers, Christians, just chose to just say, I'm gonna do the will of God. If we all, like if a room this side just said, I'm committing to do the will of God, not going to make us perfect. 
but we could actually stop all the other things that we've come up with this church because a movement of Jesus would literally break out. You wouldn't be able to stop it. And so what if tomorrow we just chose to pick one thing from the will of God and do it? Our prayer team is gonna be up here when I close here in a moment. If you're feeling like, I wanna do it, but there's sin or pain or something, man, take it to the Lord in prayer. Don't leave this room without coming forward or they'll be in the back to pray with our prayer team. If you have not entered into the kingdom of God or decided to follow Jesus, don't leave this room without praying a simple prayer to enter into the kingdom of God and begin to do his will. I love you guys. Let's stand up. I'm gonna pray for us and you guys can head on out of here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for what he did on the cross and the picture of what he got a foretaste of in the garden. God, we thank you that even he, the son of God, he still chose, in spite of what he felt, he still chose to do your will and to continue his journey to the cross so that we could experience an eternity of your kingdom, the kingdom of God. God, we long to do your will. If we are in a place of pain or sin or we just don't wanna do your will, would you give us your heart? Would you change our desires and cause us and lead us to desire to do the will of God? We wanna see your kingdom break out ultimately so that you receive all the glory. So do a new thing in our church. Help us to do your will. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We will see you guys next week. All right, we are mission. Have a good one. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's teaching. We pray that it helps you in your journey in finding and following Christ. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or to our podcast so that you don't miss any of our upcoming messages. And again, we would love to see you here at 82 Stratford Drive on any Sunday morning. We will see you very soon.